hello viewers welcome to today's lecture on transmission of analog signal in the last two lectures we have discussed about the transmission of digital signal there we have seen how analog and digital data can be encoded into the into a digital signal form and which can be transmitted through the uh, media transmission media various types of transmission media and we have seen how the encoding is done so that the signal matches with the the, the the bandwidth of the signal matches with the bandwidth of the transmission media so that it passes with less attenuation less distortion and also it provides you necessary signaling for synchronization and other purposes error detection and also synchronization is possible. Now we shall focus on the transmission of analog signal and in this lecture we shall cover these topics. First we shall discuss uh, why modulation, it is essential an introduction to this particular lecture, the need for modulation. Then we shall consider various modulation techniques and in this particular lecture we shall primarily focus on amplitude modulation. So, we shall introduce to you the basic concepts of amplitude modulation. Then you will see there is a concept called modulation index which will be introduced to you. Then frequency spectrum of AM signal we shall consider. Average power of different frequency components whenever a, 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 a signal is amplitude modulated it generates different frequency components and what are the what what uh, what is the average power of different frequency components that we shall consider then we shall consider uh, some special situations like single sideband ssb and dsb sc double sideband suppressed carrier transmission finally we shall discuss about the recovery of baseband signal after attending attending this lecture the students will be able to explain the need for modulation. They will be able to distinguish between modulation techniques. They will be able to identify the key features of amplitude modulation. Then they will be able to explain the advantages of SSB and DSBSC transmission. Finally, they will be able to explain how the baseband signal can be recovered from the received signal. So, this is this diagram gives you the basic scheme of analog data to analog signal. Here as you can see we have used one analog data as an input to the uh, analog to digital analog to analog conversion system. Here uh, apart from applying this analog data another auxiliary signal which is known as uh, usually that is a sinusoidal signal which is applied to this uh, analog to analog converter and that is known as carrier. And this carrier is essentially a sinusoidal signal and uh, as we shall see uh, the one of the important parameters of this carrier as you know. Uh, a particular analog signal whenever it is a sinusoidal there are three important parameters by which the signal can be characterized that is amplitude, phase and frequency. Either one of them individually or a combination of them are modified to generate a signal which is not known as modulated signal. So, here is your modulated signal. Modulate, modulated signal and this process of applying a signal to be modulated signal to be modulated. So, this is known as modulating signal. So, modulating signal and carrier these two are applied to the uh, converter uh, the modulator and this process of uh, conversion from analog data to analog signal which involves manipulation of one or more of the parameters of the carrier that is 
uh, amplitude, frequency or phase that characterizes the analog signal. This process is known as modulation. So, this process is known as modulation. And you may be asking why modulation is necessary. You will see that when we do modulation, one important operation that is being performed on the signal which is known as frequency translation. What it does? It translates the signal from one region of frequency domain to another region. It is like this. Suppose this is the representation of the signal in frequency domain. So, here you have got your f and obviously in this you have got the amplitude. Now, suppose you have a signal uh, with frequency range say f 1 and f 2. So, this is the range of frequency and we can say that this is the, uh, this is how you can represent it. You have frequency components from f 1 to f 2. Now, by modulation this, these two frequencies, this, this signal can be translated to another frequency range say f 1 dash to f 2 dash. So, to this. So, it can be translated to another frequency range. And usually this frequency range f 1 dash or f 2 dash is much higher than f 1 and f 2. So, this is how this can be uh, translated. However, the information com com content of the translated signal is such that the original signal can be recovered from it. Now, you may be asking what is the benefit of this? The benefit of this is one important benefit of this is that you will be able to use a, an antenna of uh, practical size. So, whenever you do translation say baseband signal to higher frequency which can be transmitted through a band pass channel using an antenna of smaller size. Suppose you are trying to send a 1 kilohertz signal and what is the uh, wavelength for this? If this is the frequency, what is the lambda value? As you know the wavelength will be 300,000 meter. We have already discussed about it. Now, whenever you are trying to send a frequency of 1 kilohertz, the wavelength is 300,000 meter and obviously the antenna has to be comparable to this size. Obviously, an antenna of this size 300,000 meter is impractical, you cannot do it. However, if you translate it to a frequency say uh, translate it to let us assume you translate it to say 10 megahertz. Whenever you translate it to 10 megahertz, the, this will correspond to a lambda that is equal to only 30 meter. Obviously, it is quite possible to have a, a, an antenna of 30 meter. So, after translating this to a higher frequency, then you can have an antenna of smaller size and then this signal, this modulated signal can be transmitted uh, very easily using smaller size antenna. And of course, at the other end after receiving it, you have to do demodulation which we shall discuss later. So, this is the uh, first benefit of modulation, you will be able to have an antenna of practical size. What are the other benef benefits? Another important uh, benefit of this modulation is narrow bending. Suppose you are trying to send a frequency range of say uh, high fidelity audio frequency range which has frequency range of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So, you can say hi fi audio. Obviously, you are sending, you sending music and other thing. So, you see the ratio of the highest frequency to lowest frequency is quite high. That means, highest frequency is uh, 20 kilohertz and the lowest frequency is 20 hertz. The ratio between highest frequency to lowest frequency is 1000. And obviously, if you design an antenna uh, for this frequency, then it is not at all suitable for this frequency. 
or if you design a and design an antenna for high, highest frequency then it will not be suitable suitable for transmission for lowest frequency so you see a single antenna will not be able to cover or able to transmit both the signals effectively and efficiently now suppose you modulate it using 1 megahertz signal the carrier frequency is 1 megahertz now this frequency is translated to say 1 megahertz that is your 10 to the power 6 plus 20 hertz and this one becomes uh, 20 into 10 to the power 3 plus 10 to the power 6 megahertz 6 hertz so you see now you take the ratio if you take the ratio between the two the ratio will be only 1.002 that means if you design an antenna for this frequency highest frequency that will be able to send the lowest frequency very easily because as you can see the ratio between the highest and lowest frequency is only 1.002 in other words a single antenna will be able to transmit both the frequencies efficiently and effectively that this process is essentially narrow bending you see uh, we are con converting a wide band signal, wide band not in terms of abs absolute values. You can see here 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, their frequency is not really very high frequencies. However, this is you may consider it wide band in terms of the ratio of the highest frequency to lowest frequency. Now, it is translated into a frequency of very narrow band. and narrow band we having the ratio of highest to lowest is only 1.002. So, you see this allows you to transmit uh, very effectively by using suitable antenna. So, this narrow bending is another benefit of this modulation. Third benefit is multiplexing. As you have seen whenever you do the multiplexing, suppose here is, here is your signal original signal uh, having bandwidth. Uh, say 0 to let us assume this is f 1 to f 2, f 1 is very close to 0. This signal is usually called is usually called uh, base band, base band signal. Now, you translate to a frequency say from f 1 dash to f 2 dash. Now, this is converted into a uh, band pass signal which can be transmitted through a band pass channel. Now, another frequency of the same range can be translated to, an, to frequencies such as f 1 double dash to f 2 double dash. Now, both of them can be sent through the same channel as you can see here since the uh, this this is this the band this is uh, you can you can separate them with the help of band pass filter after at the receiving end in other words this allows you to send both these two separate signals simultaneously through a transmission media this process is known as multiplexing and this allows you frequency division multiplexing as you can see here the frequency range or the bandwidth available is divided say this is uh, one part this is another part in this way you can divide it into a number of frequency range which can be sent uh, through the transmission media then at the other end the receivers will be will be able to separate them by suitable filtering so this is another benefit of this uh, modulation that is multiplexing it allows you multiplexing uh, here are the various modulation techniques that is possible as i told you will be able to uh, modify one of the three parameters amplitude, frequency and phase. Whenever you vary the amplitude, we get amplitude modulation that means amplitude of the carrier. Second alternative is known as angle modulation where you, you are uh, modifying the frequency that means the frequency of the carrier is modified. Uh, based on the, uh, the signal to be sent or modulating signal or it can be phase modulation. These two together are known as angle modulation. In this lecture, we shall primarily focus on amplitude modulation. 
So, here you see we are giving an example of a signal, this is a uh, baseband signal of low frequency. In this case, it is a sinusoidal signal and this is your carrier and here as you can see the amplitude of this carrier has been modified uh, uh, with the help of this uh, baseband signal. That means, now uh, here the amplitude is maximum, so you have, you have got amplitude, maximum amplitude, here it is minimum, so minimum amplitude. So, we get a carrier frequency with, vary, with time varying amplitude, this is known as modulated signal. So, here you get modulated signal. And this process, this is the how it is done, we shall discuss. Uh, let the waveform uh, is represented by this equation E m t is equal to uh, capital E m cos twice pi f m t. Here you see we are considering that the modulating waveform is a sinusoidal wave with frequency f m having maximum amplitude E m. And the carrier signal is represented by E c t. Uh, equal to capital E c, capital E c cos toid by F c plus phi c. Here you see the maximum amplitude is E c, it has got uh, frequency F c and a phase difference phi c. Then the equation of the modulated signal can be given by S t which is equal to capital E c plus capital E m cos 2 pi F m t into cos 2 pi F c t. So, this is the signal which is generated after modulation and there is a important parameter called modulation index which is represented by m. m is given by e max minus e min by e max plus e min that is equal to uh, if, if you look at this diagram here you see this is your e min. and this is your E max of the modulated signal. Now, that E max and E min, uh, if E max and E min are the maximum and minimum values, then modulation index M, M is equal to E max minus E min by E max plus E min. Then it, as you can see here, E max is equal to E c plus E m. That means, uh, here as you can see, this maximum amplitude, this maximum amplitude will be equal to E max which is equal to E m plus E c. On the other hand, this minimum amplitude will be equal to E min which is equal to E m minus E c. Then m that we get is equal to uh, m is equal to modulation index is equal to E min by E max, uh, e, sorry uh, that is given by uh, E max minus E min by E max plus E min which is equal to E m by E c. That means, we get with in this case we get m is equal to E, e m by E c. In this particular case E m is equal to given by the amplitude maximum amplitude of the modulating signal and E c is the maximum amplitude of the modulated signal. Now, this kind of waveform you get whenever the value of m is equal to less than 1. That means, the amplitude of the modulating signal, maximum amplitude of the modulating signal is less than the maximum amplitude of the carrier. Then we get a waveform like this. Now, let us see uh, what happens whenever you uh, increase the modulation index. As you increase the modulation index, or the value of m, as you can see here, the value of E m has been increased compared to the previous diagram. So, here what has been done? E m has been made equal to E c. So, in that case, what will what is happening? You are getting uh, the value of m is equal to 1, because m is equal to E m by E c. So, uh, for E m, uh, m is equal to 1, as you can see, in this case the the since uh, this this signal amplitude of this and the amplitude of this is same 
then uh, the difference is 0 and the maximum value is 2 E C. So, it varies from 0 to 2 E C. So, in that case we get the uh, maximum modulation that means, this is the maximum permissible modulation possible because as we shall see in the next slide when you get m is equal to greater than 1, here the value of E m has been made greater than E c. So, when E m is greater than E c, then value of m is greater than 1 and in such a case we get a waveform like this and it can be shown that whenever you, you have m is greater than 1, then you do not get uh, it is not possible to recover the signal at the other end. That means, recovery of the signal will not be possible whenever the modulation index is greater than 1. Uh, let us now look at the frequency spectrum of the modulated signal. First, let us consider whenever we are modulating uh, with uh, by using a sinusoidal a m. That means, the modulating signal is a sinusoidal signal uh, and in that case the modulated signal will be equal to S t equal to E c into 1 plus m cos twice pi f m t into cos twice pi f c t, which can be extended into uh, which can be expanded to E c cos twice pi f c t plus m E c cos twice pi f m t cos twice pi f c t this particular uh, particular term can be expanded can be represented by this form. So, m by 2 E c cos twice pi f c minus f m t plus m by 2 E c cos twice pi f c plus f m t. So, we now, we, we now uh, notice that there are three frequency component. One frequency component is f c another frequency component is f c minus f m and third frequency component is f c plus f m. So, after modulating a uh, sinusoidal carrier with the help of a sinusoidal modulating signal, we get three frequency components and their respective amplitudes are shown in this diagram. Here we see we get a carrier of peak amplitude E c, we get lower sideband, this is known as lower sideband. lower side band, this is your carrier and this is your upper side band or higher side band. So, this higher side band has an amplitude m c by 2 e c. So, we see uh, m by 2 e c, e c and m, m by 2 e c, these are the three uh, signals having amplitude different amplitudes. So, E c cos twice pi f c t and uh, m by 2 E c cos twice pi f c minus f m t and so these are the three frequency components. Obviously, these amplitudes are dependent on the since m is as you know the ratio of uh, uh, E m by E c essentially this will be equal to uh, e, e m by 2 and this will be also will be equal to E m by 2. That means, the side band uh, frequency uh, frequencies will have amplitude that is equal to E m by 2, because m by 2 into E c will be equal to as you know m is equal to E m by E c. So, E c will cancel out will give you E m by 2. That means, the amplitude amplitude of the side frequencies will be equal to E m by 2, which is dependent on the amplitude of the modulating signal. Now, what is the effect of this? Uh, let us take with the help of an example. Suppose here a carrier of 1 megahertz and peak value 10 volt is modulated by a 5 kilohertz sine wave uh, having amplitude maximum amplitude 6 volt determine the modulation index and frequency spectrum. So, in this case what is the value of m? Value of m will be equal to E m is 6 and E c is equal to 10. So, this is 6 by 10 that is 0 0.6 obviously, this is less than 1 that is very good. We get uh, good quality signal which can be recovered that means, original signal can be recovered from the uh, mod, uh, modulated signal that is being received and what will be the range of frequencies? 
So, what will be the range of frequencies? 1 megahertz uh, minus that means 10 to the power 6 minus 5 kilohertz 5 into 10 to the power 3 2 it will be 10 to the power 6 plus 5 into 10 to the power 3. So, you see the this will be the range of frequencies and bandwidth is equal to is difference of the two that means equal is equal to 10 into 10 to the power 3 hertz or the bandwidth is 10 uh, kilohertz. So, we see that bandwidth is not uh, very high twice that of the modulating signal. So, this is shown in this particular diagram. So, here we see the modulation index as we calculated 0 0.6 and the side frequencies are 995 kilohertz and uh, so, since it we are, we are modulating with the sinusoidal, the other frequencies are not there, we shall get three frequency components 995 kilohertz, 1000 kilohertz and 1005 kilohertz. So, these are the frequencies and you can see here we get the three, uh, three amplitudes of the frequency components, the carrier will have 10 volt, the side bands will have 3 volt. So, this is the uh, that frequency domain representation of the signal uh, of the modulated signal. Obviously, the time domain representation we have already seen that time domain representation we, will be somewhat like this, somewhat like this and on the other hand the frequency domain representation as you can see here will have uh, like this that means uh, three, three spectral components. So, now let us consider uh, the bandwidth whenever the modulating signal is not a simple sinusoidal wave. We are now modulating the signal with the help of audio signal and in that case the audio signal has a bandwidth of B m. So, we can see from almost 0 to B m that is the bandwidth of the audio signal. Now, the modulated signal will have bandwidth starting from f c minus b m. So, here is your f c minus b m to f c plus b m and as you can see bandwidth is equal to 2 b m that is the bandwidth of the signal. So, the bandwidth of the modulated signal is 2 b m as it is written there. So, we see that after modulating a uh, modulating a carrier of frequency f c, we get frequency translated signal having bandwidth twice the bandwidth of the modulated signal modulated modulating signal. So, modulating signal is has bandwidth b m. So, we get twice the bandwidth and of course, the amplitudes of different frequencies uh, will be based on the modulation index as we have seen. Now, how much power will be associated for transmitting this signal? It is very important to know to understand the power required for transmission of the analog signal. So, as you, as you have seen there are three different frequency components. So, each of the frequency components will require power for transmitting through the antenna. So, let us assume that the uh, power is developed act as a resistor of value r, then for the carrier the peak the uh, average power is equal to E c square by 2 r and the sideband frequencies uh, to for this is for sinusoidal wave. So, for any one of the sinusoidal frequency that will be equal to uh, you know this is voltage uh, m, m is c by 2. So, that is V square by 2 r. 2 r. So, here it is uh, P c into m square by 4. So, since there will be two, two side bands <coughs> to calculate the total average power, you have to add the power required for transmission of the carrier and also the power required for transmission of two side bands. So, if you add up you get the total power required for transmission that is equal to P c into 1 plus m square by 2 that is the total power required for transmission. Now, 
one very interesting observation from this is that maximum power is required for transmission of the carrier. Uh, we have seen in the previous diagram, you can see here it is E c square by 2 r and about uh, um, as you can see uh, depending on the modulation index, the side band power as you know usually m is less than equal to 1. So, this, this value will be always less than 1 fourth, that means you are using 1 fourth of the power less than 1 fourth of the power to transmit one of the side bands. That means, half of the power is transmitted to send the two side bands less than half and half of the power you are using to transmit the uh, carrier signal. Now, for recovery purpose, do you really need all the three frequency components? It has been found that uh, we can recover the uh, original signal even if even when the carrier is not transmitted. That means, even if we have two side bands, then we can recover. So, that has led to what is known as double side band with suppressed carrier modulation. So, transmission is possible by suppressing the carrier and by sending only the two side bands. Another alternative is you can send one of the two side bands. So, the original signal can be theoretically recovered, there are some practical aspects that we shall consider later. However, it is possible to recover the modulating signal from one of the two side bands. So, if we can send only one of the two side bands and can recover the original signal that is modulating signal, that means, uh, we, we, shall, we shall be able to uh, uh, perform transmission with minimum power. The power required for transmission, power required to drive the antenna will be much less. So, uh, this has led to two different types of modulation, one is double side band suppressed carrier modulation. So, this utilizes the transmitted power more efficiently than double side band AM transmission. The normal transmission is known as DSB AM, where we are transmitting both the side bands as well as the carrier. So, what has been done? This is your uh, normal DSB transmission, double side band transmission. Now, uh, the carrier has been removed and as we have seen, as you can see here, we, we have got only two side bands. So, this is your DSB SC, double side band with suppressed carrier transmission. So, we see the carrier is not present. So, the, to transmit this signal, uh, will require only will, will require less than half the power than that is possible by using double side band transmission. So, this is the primary advantage of the DSBSC modulation. However, it has some disadvantage in recovering the signal that we shall discuss later. As we have mentioned, the another alternative is to use single side band modulation. So, in single side band modulation, as you can see, uh, you can send either the upper side band or the lower side band. So, in this particular case, as we have seen, the power required for transmission is not only one fourth, less than one fourth, I would say, if modulation index is less than one, obviously, the power requirement will be less than one fourth. And not only you will be able to transmit with lesser power, the bandwidth requirement is also reduced. Here you see for upper side band, bandwidth is F c 2 F c plus F m and for lower side band it is F c minus F m to F c. So, whenever uh, we, you have bandwidth crunch, you have to multiplex many signals, then single side band is the solution. So, as you can see, uh, the modulated signal can have only bandwidth of B m and as a consequence, this is very uh, efficient in terms of bandwidth as well as 
uh, in terms of energy uh, that is required for transmission. Uh, <coughs> now, let us focus on the recovery of the base, base band signal. How do you recover the base band signal at the receiving end? Obviously, we are transmitting signal with the sole purpose of getting back the, getting back the modulate, uh, modulating signal. That means, if you are uh, sending audio signal, then at the other end we would like to get back the audio signal undistorted in its original form and how that can be done. One uh, approach is uh, is by multiplying the signal second time. As you can see, let the baseband signal is empty and it uh, the after multiplying multiplication with the carrier, the signal is now uh, con get converted to empty cos twice by uh, cos WCT, WC is twice by FCT. So, we see this is the uh, modulated signal empty cos WCT is the modulated signal that is being transmitted. Now, we multiply this with the help of a, uh, using the carrier signal. So, if we multiply the original signal that is your modulating signal second time with the ca carrier signals, first time we have uh, multiplied with the carrier signal to get the modulated signal. Now, you are multiplying second time. Uh, let us see the let us see the effect. We get m t cos square w c t which can be expanded to m t half plus half cos w c 2 uh, cos half cos 2 w c t. So, we find that it has got two components one is m t by 2 another is half m t cos uh, 2 w c t. So, we observe that the baseband signal has reappeared here. However, not only the bandpass signal, the baseband signal has re reappeared, you have got two other frequency components like 2 f c minus f m and 2 f c plus f m. If you expand this uh, half m t cos 2 w c t, you will get two frequency components these are 2 f c minus f m and 2 f c minus plus f m. However, normally f c is much much greater than f m. As a consequence, these fractal components 2 f c minus f m to 2 f c <coughs> plus f m can be very easily removed by using low pass filter. That means, if you uh, use low pass filtering, then you can get back only the baseband signal. So, this approach is known as synchronous detection. That means, whenever you multiply the modulated signal second time by using a using the carrier, you get back the baseband signal after filtering out the other high frequencies such as 2 f c minus f m and 2 f c plus f m. And this process is known as synchronous detection. Now, uh, one there is one important limitation of the synchronous detection. The important limitation is the signal cos 2 w f c has to be precisely synchronous. So, the synchronous detection approach is straightforward, but the it has a disadvantage that the whenever you do the multiplication then the uh, that carrier signal which you are using for multi, uh, multiplying second time has to be precisely synchronous. That means, there should not be any phase difference. If, if there is any phase difference, then you will see that uh, after multiplication the signal that you get will not be the baseband signal. Question is how do you get the, uh, uh, the, uh, the synchronous signal? So, you have to use costly hardware to generate the syn precisely synchronous uh, carrier signal at the receiving end. At the receiving end, uh, that is why it is better to have uh, normal uh, double side band signal, double side band modulated signal. 
So, if you receive the carrier that carrier can be used to uh, uh, regenerate or generate a synchronous, uh, a synchronous uh, ca carrier which can be multiplied to get back the baseband signal. However, if you do not send the signal this if you use that DSBSC then it will be very difficult to re generate the uh, second uh, I mean uh, carrier at the receiving end synchronous carrier at the receiving, receiving end. So, this is a very uh, difficult process. On the other hand if we use that original DSM signal it can be recovered very easily by a simple circuit like this. We can use one uh, diode a capacitor and a resistor this can be grounded. So, across this you can get back. So, here you apply the modulated signal here you will get back the baseband signal. This type of simple circuit can be used if you use DSM signal that means there is no need for synchronous detection uh, you can use this kind of simple circuit as it is shown here. Uh, a diode resistor and capacitor combination can be used to uh, get back the original signal. As, as you can see here the value of R and C can be uh, chosen in such a way that uh, you can it will follow the carrier that means you will get back get the get get the, this particular uh, curve which is which will which is essentially the baseband signal. So, which will and since this frequency is very high F c is very very high then F m this this will be quite smooth and it will remove uh, you will get a uh, signal that baseband signal recovered here by using this kind of simple circuit. So, this is known as detection with the help of a diode and this is commonly used in many situation. Of course, the uh, modulated signal received at the receiving end is greatly attenuated as you know that the signal is, uh, is uh, passing through a long distance and uh, the, the, it is proper the uh, modulo the attenuation is uh, proportional to 1 by dis distance square and as a result if the receiver is at a long distance the signal will be highly attenuated. Not only that the uh, the atmosphere is always generating some noise when there is lightning, spark and at most there are various other atmospheric disturbances. So, uh, at the receiving end the signal to noise ratio is very poor and also the signal level is very low. Moreover, there may be many other channels adjacent to the uh, adjacent to the signal that means you will be using some kind of frequency division multiplexing. So, a number of channels may be transmitted and um, they can be very close side by side. So, in, in such cases the uh, recovering the signal may be little difficult. So, whenever the signal is highly uh, attenuated and you have got many channels adjacent to it the signal has to be amplified before you can do detection and the noises are to be removed by suitable filtering. And for this purpose one approach that is commonly followed is known as super heterodyne approach. Uh, let me explain the super heterodyne approach with the help of the block diagram that is used commonly used. Here you see you are you have got an antenna this is the receiver complete receiver circuit here is your antenna where you are receiving signal of the order of maybe micro volt or less. Then there is an uh, RF amplifier, RF amplifier is essentially uh, amplifying the carrier signal. So, this ampli this is tuned to the carrier frequency. So, here there is a uh, tuned circuit and that is uh, that, that is amplifying the RF carrier tuned amplifier. Then in the super heterodyne technique what you do you use a 
local oscillator local oscillator having frequency f o s c this local oscillator frequency is greater than greater than the f r f that it is greater than the r f frequency so uh, this local oscillator frequency is mixed with the amplified carrier signal amplified uh, rf signal and whenever you do that as you know the signal that we have received is shown here which has the carrier frequency and two side bands now whenever you do the mixing with the help of a local oscillator which has higher frequency than frf that's why it is called super heterodyne if this oscillator frequency is less than the rf then uh, it is not super heterodyne and whenever you multiply F, uh, mix with fsc and this uh, modulated carrier you get you will get uh, frequency spectrum like this you, get, you will get intermediate frequencies equal to f osc minus fc and uh, f osc plus SC, fc that means you get frequency f i f is equal to f osc minus fc and also uh, fosc plus fc these two will be there now what you do you simply filter that fif that intermediate frequency is filtered with the help of uh, intermediate frequency amplifier so intermediate frequency amplifier not only it uh, filters out this frequency component it also does then it also amplifies it so it does the filtering and amplification together and then it is applied to a detector so here it is applied to a detector that detector will generate uh, the baseband signal so the baseband signal and of course that rf there will be some uh, the radio frequency noises which can be filtered out with the help of low pass filter as shown here then you will get will be uh, will be applying to a audio amplifier so after uh, detection and low pass filtering you will get back the audio signal as it is shown here so which is apply which is amplified and applied to a loudspeaker this is the typical am receiver am receiver that we use in our uh, houses this is a common household item so this super heterodyne approach provides us a number of benefits first of all it is used to improve adjacent channel selection it provides necessary gain because as you can see amplification is done at different stages so here it can be microvolt then it is here millivolt before whenever you do the detection here it can be of the, of the order of order of volt so microvolt to volt uh, gain of about 1000 is uh, performed uh, as it as it goes from rf to audio then uh, it provides you better signal to noise ratio because that's uh, because of the uh, filtering and also the tuned filtering that uh, only the carrier frequency is received so the signal uh, noise is rejected and we get the good quality signal and this is the commonly used technique of popular am receivers so we have discussed the amplitude modulation te technique we have discussed what is modulation index the frequency spectrum the power to power required for transmission and uh, we have also discussed how the signal can be recovered and in the next lecture we shall discuss about the angle modulation and as you, as i have mentioned it has got uh, two different versions frequency modulation and phase modulation and this is how it will look like you see there will be no change in amplitude but frequency is modulated here are the review questions based on this lecture first one is why are the what are why are the benefits of i think it will be what are the benefits of what are the benefits of analog modul modulation techniques second question is what are the possible analog to analog modulation techniques third question is what is the bandwidth requirement of 
amplitude modulated signal. Fourth question is what is the single sideband transmission? What is single sideband transmission? What are the advantages of SSB transmission? Single sideband transmission. Fifth question is why synchronous detection is not commonly used to recover the baseband signal? Now it is time to give the answers of the previous lecture. First question was why BAZS coding is preferred over Manchester coding for long distance communication. As you know the B8JS encoding is preferred over Manchester encoding because B8JS encoding requires lesser bandwidth. Bandwidth as we have seen is equal to the bandwidth of the signal, baseband signal. Uh, but the Manchester encoding has bandwidth about twice the uh, almost twice the baseband signal. So, we see that uh, B8JS has lesser bandwidth which is useful that is why it is preferred for long distance communication. Second question was why is it necessary to limit the band of a signal, bandwidth of a signal here also bandwidth of a signal before performing sampling. Answer is it is necessary to limit the bandwidth of a signal before sampling so that the basic requirement of sampling theorem that is the sampling rate should be twice or more than twice the maximum frequency component of the signal is satisfied. This is known as Nyquist rate as I have already discussed. If it is violated original signal cannot be recovered from the uh, sample signal. So, it will suffer some kind of distortion which is known as aliasing error. Third question was distinguish between PAM and, PAM and PCM signals answer is in order to recover or in order to convert analog data to digital signal initially sampling is done on the analog data by using sample and hold circuit. The output of the sample and hold circuit is known as PAM signal. The PAM signal is then converted to PCM signal. So, PAM is essentially an intermediate step to get back to get the PCM signal. After you have got the PCM signal you a analog to digital converter is used to quantize the signal, then you uh, use an encoder to generate the PCM signal, line encoding is done. So, you see PAM is essentially an intermediate step for PC generating PCM signal. Fourth question was what is quantization error, how can it be reduced? Answer is to convert analog signal to an to digital signal, the analog signal is first sampled and each of these analog, sa analog samples must be assigned a binary code. In other words, each sample is approximated by being quantized into some binary codes as we have already seen. As the quantized values are only approximations, it is impossible to recover the original signal exactly and this leads to quantization error. And quantization error can be minimized by using nonlinear encoding as we have already discussed. Fifth question was explain how in and in what situation DPCM that is differential PCM performs better than PCM. The answer is DPCM performs better when the input is slowly changing as in case of voice signal. As we have already seen whenever the signal is slowly changing then the differential PCM will require very small number of bits and as we know the delta modulation is the extreme case where you require only one bit. So, however, if the signal is not slowly changing then uh, this approach cannot be used. So, only when the signal is slowly changing this can be used, PC, the PCM has better performance than PCM. So, with this we come to the end of today's lecture. Thank you. Hello and welcome to today's lecture on analog transmission. This is the second lecture on this topic and in this lecture we shall cover these following points. I shall give a brief introduction what we have discussed in the last lecture on the same topic. After that I shall introduce to you the basic concepts of 
angle modulation and essentially we will see angle modulation involves two types of mod modulation, frequency modulation and phase modulation. Then I shall discuss the relationship between frequency modulation and phase modulation. Then we shall consider the bandwidth and power of for required for FM and PM transmission. Then we shall switch to a different topic, basic concepts of digital data to digital signal conversion, where there will be three different types. First one will be amplitude shift keying and we shall consider in detail the various issues related to amplitude shift keying, particularly frequency spectrum of uh, ASK signal the power requirement for transmission of ASK signal and also we shall discuss about the frequency and phase shift gain. Then we shall end our lecture with applications of different types of uh, conversion technique, digital signal conversion techniques. And on completion of this lecture, the students will be able to explain the basic concepts of angle modulation they will be able to distinguish between the FM and PM, particularly their interrelationship. Then explain the basic concepts of digital data to digital signal conversion. So here we see we have got the digital data in terms of 1s and zeros, which is converted into some signal. Then we get the uh, analog signal. So you see here according to this data, this is some modulation has been done to get analog signal. Here you see it is analog signal. This corresponds to logic bit 1, this corresponds to 0, this corresponds to 1, this corresponds to 0, this corresponds to 2 ones, then 2 zeros. So this corresponds to the, the data that we are transmitting. But instead of sending 1, we are sending analog signal. For 0, you are not sending anything like that. And this is your analog signal. And the, there are three distinct types of digital to analog modulation technique. One is known as amplitude shift keying, phase shift keying and frequ uh, frequency shift keying and phase shift keying. And as we shall see, uh, amplitude shift keying and phase shift keying can be combined to have another type of modulation technique which is known as quadrature amplitude modulation QAM. So we shall discuss all these four types of modulations ASK, FSK, ESK and QAM in this lecture. So review questions are number one, which modulation technique is used in optical communication? Second question is what are the three modulation techniques possible in modems?